Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Computomics podcast. Today, we'll talk about startups in the ag tech world, as well as technological trends in agriculture markets worldwide. And as my guest today, I'm happy to introduce Randall Barker, the co-founder and CEO of Intent and a strategic advisory board chairperson at Computomics. Welcome, Randy. Uh, thank you, Anna. It's great to be here and excited for our conversation today. As am I. Um, I warned you before, we like to start out of left field here. Um, and I know sources have told me that you've referred to yourself as an ag nerd. Um, we will be going into the ag part of that equation in a second. But I was wondering, um, what other areas are you a nerd in or what's your nerd passion outside of the agricultural world? Yeah, I, I think I have several. So I'm passionate about uh, biology from everything from gardening to uh, animals, horses, um, always been interested in, in uh, human health as well. So those are fascinating topics. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, I've always been interested in engineering, everything from small motors, cars, uh, to toy trains, you, you name it, uh, engineering fascinates me. So that, that really has suited me well in agriculture where biology and engineering are always uh, connected. And, and then I think the third leg has been the environment, which is the fusion of both um, when we have nature and climate. So th those things just constantly fascinate me. And I love to talk to experts, particularly in any of those fields. Mm -hmm. And in a way, you brought a lot of those passions into the company you founded, into Intent, right? If uh, uh, if you could just give us a quick insight, what does Intent do? What's uh, the the area you're active in? Yeah, we we specialize in helping ag technologies or innovations get to market, and when we say market, that ultimately means being used by farmers. And how we go about that is really starting on the farm with large-scale trials and using precision ag data, advanced sensors, climate data, soils, and traditional agronomy to, to understand what's happening in the field um, and accepting the variance of, of both practices and, and overall land variability. So that, you know, that's one piece of our process. The other part is taking that information and applying it in a business sense so that companies can project, where would my product work best? Where does it create the most value? Um, where should I build my go-to-market strategy, my retailer structures? Uh, which farmers would benefit most by crop, by region? So from an intent perspective, we're just trying to be much more specific in the on farm adoption segment. I think from an R&D perspective, there's great product advancement and uh, process, but when it gets to actual farmers using it, being that they use things very differently, it doesn't matter, you know, mm. if you're both high tech farmers, uh, I can be really certain it will be applied or used slightly differently, not completely differently, but slightly. <laughs> and, and that's, that's really you know, how we're using really large data, um, essentially to, to accept the variance of, in systems to, to make sure that farmers can use products and practices most effectively. So that's, that's mm -hmm. what we intend. And it's all backed by, um, software, uh, AI machine learning as well. Mm -hmm. You refer to it as a system, and there are many variables in that system. I'd like to go into a couple of them, actually. So um, you said there's there's a difference in what maybe the R and D kind of envisions, and then the reality of how farmers actually <laughs> implement new technologies. Um, what do you see at the moment? Maybe what what are technologies that are being implemented, or where there's there's a change, where there's a big gap that you need to help bridge with intent? Yeah, I, I think there's. You know, multiple segments that that we're seeing, which are good things. So I could use one is in the space of biologicals or biorational products that that are more sustainable and lower impact to the environment. Which you know, as a category, is is great. Um, the challenge is, is they work differently than our familiar synthetic uh, based products. So when we tackle that 
uh, type of problem, we see them performing differently on farms. And, and what we need to do is get large, widespread testing. And you go, it's maybe one biological that improves plant health, but they're going to use that in a system with various seeds, various fertilizers on various pieces of land. Um, and, in, and the weather changes year to year. So if you think about all those variables outside the specific product, it takes some real effort um, to understand how that works on farm. What R&D usually is trying to do with those products is going, what does this biological do, mm -hmm. right? It creates plant health, okay? So they were trying to reduce variables to prove that it does um, produce plant health. What they're not doing at that same time is often understanding under what conditions that would occur. And that's where you get this large gap between R&D, product advancement, to understand which product and candidate does what, which is really important from a science standpoint, to going what matters in, in the outside world. Mm -hmm. So you cross this threshold of proving a point that that a, a biological does something very specific that's useful, right, through the advancement process. But then we have this gap to going, now it's, it, I would say, you know, it's like raising raising a child and sending it out to the world. Um, you go from a very controlled environment where family is understood, everything is somewhat predictable, and then you go, good luck, mm -hmm. and, and many things can happen. So that, that's kind of how we look at um, product advancement from R&D. And it's usually trying to reduce variance of external factors. And you're trying right? to bring so them back can, in, in a way, right? Well, without, without uh, we must bring mm -hmm. them back in because that's how that world is going to operate. So, you know, where we've started seeing success is starting to drive some overlap and, and methods so that we can do both at the at the same mm -hmm. time. Could you give an example of such an overlap or, or a method where, where you've been able to successfully bridge that gap? Yeah. So so if we think about, you know, early R&D advancement is, you know, let's say it's we'll stay in the biological space. Do you, you select or find a, a microbe that has an activity or creates a result that you're looking for. Say we'll stay in plant health and it's creating a healthier plant through response. Well, as we move that through to final product, formulated, how, how it's going to be handled, processed, mm -hmm. we start testing on farms earlier so that we can start to understand how that microbe is affected by environmental variants or farmer practice variants. So we're trying to understand resilience of, of the product at the same time that the innovator is trying to build it into a formulation. And what that results in when we overlap what I would say early product development with early stage commercialization is we end up with more reliability mm -hmm. of product and predictability of advising farmers how they can use it in their system. Right. right? So we avoid, okay, this, this would kill the microbe. Here's the conditions where you might not want to mm -hmm. use it. It actually doesn't work in this, this practice mm -hmm. set that, that might be specific to you. So you know, we could avoid those things, mm -hmm. you know, and end up with a much more robust product by doing sort of concurrently all those mm -hmm. things, not just focused on the product target outcome, but focusing on how will it respond in a real world environment. Right. And I think that's, that's really important and, and actually is uh, a big piece of what I find interesting with computomics is uh, it's, it's a similar problem tackled mm -hmm. from the genetic side. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll use that segue to computomics in a second, but I just like to delve once again into that gap part because we've focused on the the making the product more robust through the approach that you just described. The other part of the equation that I see, or that's maybe a secondary gap, is then uh, to make the farmers uh, understand or, or trust that that is a robust product, right? That's that I would consider that a secondary gap. How 
do you how do you work that gap? How do you get these results or this this better product communicated to the farmers or how does that communication work? Yeah, I think it it really starts with um transparency and and building trust so we have a large network of farmers a few thousand that are working with us in north america and when we we communicate to them to say we'd love for you to trial this on your farm we're very honest as to where where it's at in the in the life cycle and we'll say this is very exciting we think this could fit you tell us uh as a farmer, whether that fits your your interest, is that something you want to tackle? So stay at plant health. Yeah, I'd be interested in plant health. I want to know if it helps. I farm in Wisconsin. I get a lot of chilling early in the season because it's a little further north. Will it help that? And, you know, there's this practical conversation of going, it could, but it also may not. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think you have to be very honest and they go, okay, well, what else do you know? Okay, well, don't don't uh, open the canister too early. Don't leave it, you know, uh, don't mix it with these types of other products and then apply it and let's see how it goes. And I think if, you know, the expectation is then it could work, but everyone goes, we don't know if this is a 20 or 50 or 80% chance yet. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think when we approach farmers that way, they're very eager to make progress um, and they are more than willing to take risk. They they do it um, each mm-hmm. year. So if you tell them that it's a risk and they can self-identify that, well, this is important enough for me to take a risk to evaluate. Right. right? If I can solve this early uh, chilling or cooling damage to my plants. I would do it. And and then they proceed. And, you know, if it works, um, they're very excited and, and they move along. If it doesn't work, we've had many farmers go, I think I did something wrong. <laughs> or so they're they're very resilient, but I think it's it's probably part of this gap where if we do it traditionally, where we just do all this small plot work and formulation and everything is a closed mm-hmm. system and we tell the farmer that it's going to work with certainty and then they impose their variability that's where we get failures when we approach it this way and we go early and we say it could Mm -hmm. fail um that's why we've involved you in the process then it really changes the the posture and and the receptivity of it is you're engaging them in the innovation and actively you know the company the farmer and intent we can all figure out whether we're going to get there or not and it's iterative uh, as as more of a team mm-hmm. uh, and I'm going to invent something and I'm going to hand it off to you and don't worry, I I know it works and that's all we need to talk about, which if you think about humans is it, it completely skips the trust factor right. of saying, maybe you want to be involved in the conversation. Maybe you have something to, to add. And I think I you know, in the simplest form, it's um, it's establishing trust and changing the workflow to say that farmers are as critical to the innovation process as the innovation process itself. Mm-hmm. A co-creative approach, an iterative process-oriented co-creative approach is how I would sum that up. And uh, I totally see your point. Yeah. That makes sense. They have they are part of the process, and and in that way. Um, it's more likely to succeed one. And if it doesn't, there's a lot more acceptance because they, they could see the intent and they could see, um, maybe why it didn't work, <laughs> whether it's, it's their own mistake or specific regional, uh, factors that, that played a role. Very interesting. Yeah. You, you mentioned earlier, um, that you see parallels between computomics and mentioned also the, the role of data, um, in that approach or that feeds into this system. Um, can you go into a little more detail on that? Yeah, I, I mean, this is where it, it's completely deepest end of the spectrum. So if we start with the genome and the sequence of all these options of, of crops and biologics and things that, that we can tackle at computomics, and if we focus just on seed genetics, um, you know, I was thinking about it and I said, yeah, it, so much of plant breeding and advancing crops is 
very sophisticated um, and highly complex. And it, it reminds me similarly, like we're trying to characterize the climate, the the land, the soil, the interactions, and farmer behavior. I think computomics is doing that at the exact opposite end of the spectrum to intent, mm -hmm. where they're starting with this enormous uh, range of possibilities, if not larger, right? Where you go, the genomes and, and the ability to combine them is close enough to infinite, mm -hmm. right? Because <laughs> there is no uh, limit. So what what they're doing in terms of being able to organize that and get closer to reliable outcomes. So through their machine learning, instead of, you know, I, I my analogy would be, it's like, I have a destination. I know I'm going to Italy and I know it's Southern Italy, but I have to pack in the dark, right? <laughs> That's the conventional version of, I, I think I know where stuff is and I can tell the difference some of my items in the dark, but it's not really easy. Whereas in what Computomics is doing with Exceed Score and machine learning is, well, now I have a destination, I have a target, and I now have a way to make some decisions about what to pack because I can see it, I can evaluate it, and I'm just reducing huge buckets of error and what error costs us, whether it's in the intent world or in a breeder's world using uh, computomics technology is time. Um, that's the, the very difficult part of agriculture is where annual cropping or permanent cropping or even two crops a year, time is very costly um, in terms of driving adoption and investment. So computomics work early stages it's this is all investment into making um, making a better solution that is very targeted to where I'm aiming um, and I think that's the very fantastic part of being able to target a climate or an environment to my breeding program and invent to that target mm -hmm. you know wandering around hoping I get there is really can be shortened um, you know and, and I think that's the exciting prospect is how much faster can that get? Is it a 50% improvement? Mm -hmm. You know, is it over 50%? And I think what's so interesting is what we talked about in building trust and using precision ag data, data and global data, what, what intent does. We're also using machine learning and consolidating these insights saying, what's the impact of trust and acceptance given environmental variants? For farmers, and you go, wow, they're they're almost parallel because it's we're really just using huge amounts of data to derive, you know, where error is and avoid it at all mm -hmm. costs, right? We're we're not absolutely certain as to the only best answer, right? So in terms of exceed score, we're selecting the best answers for what we were tasked with, and in intent, we're we're selecting the best path that we see, but it's, it's not certain, but it's far better than the 80% that we know is wrong, right? Avoiding those errors save us enormous amount of time. And whether you're investing on, on the plant breeding side or you're investing in commercializing a product, both of those are just huge costs. If you are two years behind and you think of a team, 10 or 20 people working on the wrong stuff unknowingly, mm -hmm. but the the economic cost of that time is is dramatic, both from you know sheer dollars spent on something that doesn't provide value to to you or the farmer. Um, there there's also time lost in in terms of competitive advantage and advocacy, mm -hmm. right? So you know time is the most precious commodity that tends to be true, and with no surprise, farmers tell us the same thing. Their time's mm -hmm. highly valuable. They don't have time for, they have little time for risk. That's why it has to be specific and really no patience for errors that can be broken. Right. So so there must be, uh, or it sounds to me like there is actually a lot of acceptance and openness also to data-centric AI approaches or solutions like um, the ones Intent and Computomics offer also from the farmer side. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I think they are, but they remain skeptics <laughs> and... I think that's the the finesse mm -hmm. of this. 
um, utilizing technology to help them. As we've seen uh, other ventures, right, ag techs or people go that we're going to predict the outcome, Mm -hmm. right, implying or imputing certainty. And farmers, because they farmed, realize nothing Mm -hmm. certain because they know that their own behavior impacts the system. And even if they do things exactly as they plan, something else happens with the environment and it's certainly not predictable and, and so, on, so on and so forth or prices change. So they're, they're highly skeptical that any computer can answer all of that. But what they are pretty comfortable at is, well, show me, show me the data. Tell me how you're deriving better answers and, and they're, accepting of that so you know the universal they're they're willing to to accept a universal truth (laughs) you know we can specifically tell them how to farm better uh is is not going to be accepted um if we say there's some critical tools that leverages large data and contextual data of other genomes environments and other things that help us get us down to the best 20 options for your farm Mm -hmm. in a specific area of crop choice or seed selection or how to use a biological. And we used machine learning AI to get there. They will accept it. But there's this this balance of taking too much ground of certainty um, with AI or machine learning that they're uh, appropriately suspicious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, Are there any specific tech innovations or products that you're aware of or that you see kind of coming that are that are um, being received well, that have tested well? Yeah, um, I think, it, you know, we, we continue to see lots of great uh, um, products and concepts that that work very well uh, across the board. So, you know, we we've worked with uh, Pivot Bio is a, a great company with a nitrogen fixing microbe that's that is um, fantastic, both for the environment and, and, and farmers. And I think that's, that's a great example of a company that, that started, um, you know, with a great product and, and concept, but worked very diligently with farmers. Um, and we got to work alongside them to, to fulfill this process. And, you know, now they're, they're a very successful company and, and have a huge footprint. And I think that's exciting because, it's it's improving how farmers access nitrogen, so that's very mm-hmm. exciting. And um, I mean, you've you've already mentioned a couple of times how different regional specificities are and how much that you need to take them into account, right? Um, do you what differences do you see, for example, U.S. versus Europe versus um, Africa or Asia um, with adoption of these technologies and how they are implemented? Yeah, I, I think if we Think about it. It, it. It's absolutely fascinating on how technology is used in different areas. So we always have the the leading edge in uh, North America, Europe. Um, you know, I would say are pretty forward leaning in terms of infrastructure engineering. You know, equipment, um, GPS, Wi Fi, those things. On the other hand, I can also say you know. Places like uh, South America, uh, you, you see Africa, or even uh, places like Asia, Southeast Asia, the impact that they can leapfrog, you know, they may not take all the equipment infrastructure, right? It, it's difficult to catch up on roads and rails and that type of infrastructure, but their ability to adopt uh, mobile, wireless, GPS, remote sensing new sensors, new tools is remarkable. And there's, there's great examples. I mean, if we think of Brazil, um, you know, you have million acre farms, right? And they're, they're really conglomerates of farms, huge operational uh, capability. And then they really rely on technology to run that large an operation. Mm -hmm. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I see, uh, very small holders using mobile to get information about how to use or plant uh, a specific corn seed, when to spray, how to reduce exposure, Mm -hmm. right? Very simple agronomic things coming through uh, a mobile phone. And 
you know, there's two ends of the spectrum that, that are really both very valuable, um, that, that technology can help the largest farms and it can help the smallest farms and not just the um, ones in the norm, you know, northern hemisphere that we're familiar mm-hmm. with. In a way, almost a democratization of this, this, uh, this approach as well, right? Um, I wouldn't say one size fits all, yeah. <laughs> but one approach fits all in a way. Yeah, th- there's some fundamental truths. And I think uh, same can be said in, in this plant breeding example that, you know, as that becomes refined with the tools that are being applied is we can now um, solve for smaller markets. So the more efficient the technology gets, the more accessible it is to smaller entities, right? So this is a, seems like a really simple economic problem, which we mm-hmm. talked about is if I spend too much time and error in inventing, right? More, more money spent to invent fewer products. If I use technology to invent more products that are more customized to fit a piece of land, a region, a farmer, whether you know, I'm on the intense side or a computomics breeding side, that's wonderful because it reduces the cost to bring a specific solution to market. And that could be a sensor, a software, uh, a plant variety. And, you know, if someone said, well, there's only 100,000 acres of this product. Previously, technology in plant breeding and, and trying to, to make a, a market or even achieve that was was so costly people would avoid it but as the costs of of plant breeding and innovation drive downward we can we can start to say we can tackle this hundred thousand acre opportunity we can help these small holders we can do many more things because the cost to to enable them is so much lower this may be too far reaching but um, I actually talked to a researcher recently from Nigeria who's doing a lot of data analysis um, and looks at how geopolitical factors and cultural factors such as the the amount of of conflict um, as well as kind of hereditary traditions impact production levels um, is that an area that also f- like flows into your development process or that that you're looking to expand into or is that something where you're like oh no that's we can't cover that um, but it's cool to know that that exists <laughs> yeah absolutely it exists and and you know from an intense perspective we've been building us canada south america outward um but my previous work you know globally influences um this thinking is is that i absolutely agree is that you know there's there's fundamental anthropological mm-hmm. systems right that are present into wherever you're operating that influence whether that's currency lack of currency barter uh, cultural traditions, mm-hmm. you know, those things are very fundamental to any any technology being adopted because it, it may be something as simple as you know they they don't touch this color. Wow, right? yeah. Mm-hmm. And you go, why wouldn't they use it? Oh, someone said they don't greens bad luck in this year, and you're like, oh, I had we had no mm-hmm. clue. Um, so so you go, well, it couldn't be that simple, and and often it isn't. But there are so many existing, you know, variables that need to be considered um, at the same time. So we always said in evaluating adoption was, you know, you had product performance that was always um, uh, critical. It's perception, mm-hmm. right? The end user, how do they perceive that input? And then all these what we call other factors could be weather, commodities, these socio-political uh, events. Um, Security, food safety, availability, drought, all these things are always working in concert. And, and I think it is, you know, some pretty fascinating, um, fascinating piece of work. And I, I think that's where usually the best ideas come from is when in Nigeria, those types of factors are highly prevalent and probably one of the largest things to be addressed in, in solving the, the, technical efficiency aspect and you go it's probably the right place to focus there because go if i brought the best technology and all the tools that not being addressed would be the barrier 
Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm afraid time is running short, so I'd like to finish with a question that's a little like, like turning back to left field almost. Um, uh, and I'd be interested as a founder of an ag tech startup that you are, uh, what, what are maybe a few tips, like maybe your top three tips that you would give uh, a startup in the ag tech space? What, what should they watch out for? Yeah, I, I think number one is be be clear on on what you're trying to achieve, and make sure that you you answer the questions: is why does this matter to my customer? And your customer can be a farmer, it could be a B two B solution. So make sure you really understand why what what am I working on, and, and why is it valuable. Um, the next layer is. Um, Patience and, and perseverance. Uh, the number of errors you will make will be most likely significant. And, and you really have to be open to, to, to accepting of mistakes and moving on very quickly. You, you really need a short memory. <laughs> that didn't work. That's fine. Move on. Um, and, and, and that perseverance to, to continue to drive to that. And then, you know, the final layer, you know, that underpins it that, is, is really, you have to care. You have to be passionate about it because you won't be able to achieve any of the other things of patience and perseverance and understanding why it matters to your customer and building a really cool product or, or technology. Um, if you're not, if you're not passionate about it, it's too, it's too much to ask. So if you got all those, um, you know, I still remind myself we're in the eighth year of our mm -hmm. business. <laughs> started. I'm like, be patient, keep persevering. And the passion definitely shines through, as we could hear, um, and I <laughs> could also see in this interview. Thank you so much, Randy. I hope you'll be back at some point. Uh, we can talk a little more uh, on the trends that are ongoing. For now, thank you. And I refer our audience to our uh, episodes on the Computomics webpage, computomics.com. Check out the episode page with uh, helpful links and hope to have you back with us next time. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for listening in today. Want to learn more? Then check out our show notes and more info on computomics.com. If you have questions or want to propose a next guest, please reach out to us at podcast at computomics.com. 